are not good, let me know so you don't get further and further. And again, the files that we'll be working on today are in our class folder. I've created a folder called Images for InDesign Import, and I've got six images right here. So um, with these, I'm actually going to, I'm going to put all of mine in our class folder so that I have a new copy along with you guys as well. And I like doing the right click save link as because then it puts it exactly where I want it to go instead of in the generic download folder. So I'm just going to grab all of these. Ah. So I'm sorry, there's five total. There's one duplicate that I unpublished, so uh, just the five files that we'll look at today. Um, how about now? Lamia, did you get those downloaded okay? And InDesign open? Okay. Guys, a little bit of a background on InDesign while we wait. But up until this point, we've been working with Adobe Photoshop. And Photoshop was really made to handle graphics and images. So any type of picture, basically all of the stuff that we've been doing. Now the thing that we have avoided up until this point is essentially text. So we are going to use InDesign to essentially create boards, portfolios, or even single sheets that we can import our images on and then add text on top of it. Photoshop doesn't do a great job at um, formatting text and then even when you print it, it always ends up looking slightly pixelated. So we are going to let Photoshop do what it's good at, which are images and graphics, and then we're going to let InDesign do what it's good at, which is um, putting together all of the different layouts and then text as well. What we'll be looking at today is how to start a basic document in InDesign, and it's going to be a lot of information. In the past, when I have taught this class, we've gone really, really slowly, and I've kind of lost people because it just took too long. And so this will only be my second semester where I essentially throw every single thing at you in one day. And then as the lab goes on, if you forget something or if there's something additional, you ask and we go over it together as a class. But the majority of what you guys need, I can cover in at least one class, plus maybe a little bit more, okay? So it truly is a crash course into InDesign. Now where we're going for the rest of the semester is we're learning InDesign so that we can put together a really simple portfolio of the projects that we've done in this class. So you learn how to do a portfolio layout. And then in addition to that, you'll also start working on your final project. Um, your final project will combine both Photoshop and InDesign. And I am going to give you guys a client or you can make up your own client. Uh, and what you'll be doing is essentially a room board or a mood board for that particular client. So you'll be doing a board that shows the entire room and then with those separate pieces that you put in the room, so think about your dollhouse. So when you did the dollhouse, let's say you put in a sofa and a rug, right? You're gonna show kind of a final room layout on your board, but then you're also going to create your client a book. And then in that book, not only will you show that rug and the sofa, but you might also give alternates plus a little bit of information, like what website you got it off of, how much it could be. I think one of the best things about working in Photoshop is if you do a digital board, if somebody doesn't like something, you just click off the eyeball and you can drag something back in. I think it's a really good way of working um, and editing on the fly if you need to. So that's where we'll be going for the rest of this semester. So starting today, we're going to hop into InDesign to learn how it works. And then basically from here on out, it'll be lab days for you guys, it, for you guys to kind of work towards that final project and this kind of mini portfolio to help you with the layout. Okay. Now on that note, everybody good to go? No? Good? Okay. So when you're in um, InDesign, I hope it looks familiar. Um, it should look a lot like Photoshop. So right now you should be in InDesign, so I should see IDs on your screens. 
Um, okay, good. Just wanted to make sure. And my screen looks different from yours just because I use it, and so it's showing me my recent documents. I'm not? Okay. Let me try that one more time. How about this? Okay. I don't even remember stopping projecting, but I must have at some point. Um, but this screen, again, should look familiar, right? Similar to Photoshop. And again, just because you haven't worked on anything yet, you might not see anything in your recents list. So I can see that most of you guys have the same graphic, but even after today, you'll start seeing projects compile here. So again, similar to Photoshop, what we're going to do is we're going to go to Create New. And we have similar options, Print, Web, and Mobile. Now, if you guys go to Print, and you see letter, does it show it to you in 8.5 by 11 or the 51 by 66? Okay, so it's showing it to us in PICAs, which is what graphic designers typically use. But since we're interior designers using a graphic design software, we are actually going to update that to suit our needs, okay? So it's important that we close out of this menu and we don't have any documents open. You can do this at any point, but it's better to do it without any documents open. And where I'd like you guys to go, I'll keep my cursor here for a minute, let's go to Edit, Preferences, and then Units. So when you're at home, you'll come to the same menu, and then once you find this menu, click on Units and Increments, I'll stay here for just another minute longer, but go to where it says Rulers, And ruler units, do you see how horizontal and vertical are set to picas? Let's go ahead and change that to inches. So something that we know. Now the point that I'm trying to make is that if you do this when a document is open, it only changes your preferences for that one document. And then the next document you open will be picas again. If you do it without any documents open, it'll change it for the entire system standard, okay? So should you do your edit preferences when you have a document open? No, we want to change the entire system preferences. Let's see if that works, so let's click on create new again. And if you go to print, do you guys actually see inches now? Okay, that's how you know it works. So when you start working on this at home, I'll have you guys do that same thing so it's a format that you guys understand. So let's talk about this page for just a minute. And what I'm going to do is just talk about letter paper for today and basically straight out of the box, not making any changes. So this is telling us that the document we're about to open is called Untitled 2. We can even change the name of it right here and call it InDesign Test so that when we open it, it already knows what our document is called. So when we save it, they'll know it's called InDesign Test. Um, it's telling us how big it is, 8.5 by 11. You can play with the orientation here, okay, so landscape or portrait. And this will be new. This is something called Facing Pages. Taylor, can I steal your notebook? your planner if you don't mind. So one of the most powerful things about InDesign that most other programs don't have is it actually lets you lay out a book. So typically when you're working in Microsoft Word it's essentially just single sheets that scroll one right after another. But when you're working with a portfolio it's usually not single sheets and so when you open it we've got our cover and that's always one page and then we've got another page. And then when we open it up, do you see how although this is one single sheet, it has a front and a back? And then when it's open, the back of it is open to the front of this. You guys see? And then so on. So each one of these pages kind of goes side by side. Sorry, I don't want to show your secrets. If there's secrets in there. <laughs> Make sure this like, wait a second, this is like a journal. Hold on, I saw a photo. Thank you for that. <laughs> oh. um, <laughs> So that's one of the features that we'll use when we start working on portfolios. Even today we're going to do facing pages, but just know that now when you start thinking about your layouts, think about how it looks when it's open, okay? 
So for your portfolio, it'll be facing pages. For your client booklet, it will also be facing pages. Now, if you're doing a poster, it's just single-sided because our posters, we don't print double-sided. So your boards, not your posters, sorry, your boards will be single-sided. So we'll keep it facing pages. And then, bless you, we've got our margins down here set to a half inch. And when this icon is set to a chain, it means that they all need to match each other. If you deselect that, it breaks the chain and you can make them separate. Okay? We're not making any changes yet. Really, I want to show it to you straight out of the box. So um, now that we've gone through all that, go ahead and click on Create for me. And now what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about the interface, what we're looking at, and how you'll be working with the program. So again, I hope this looks similar to Photoshop, right? We've got all of our main toolbars on the left side. Also similar to Photoshop, 90% of the time you want to be in V or move mode. Okay, so we're still in that V. And again, I wish you could see my cursor. The other thing that I'd like you guys to do is, do you guys see this property menu on the right? And then pages? Pages will be a lot like our layers, but right now the two are embedded in one another, so it's hard to see one over the other. So what I'd like you to do is pull your pages off to the side, so just click and drag it out. Everybody got that all right? Yeah? And then once you've got it out, I'm going to see, try to see if you can put it on the bottom. So it's going to be a little bit awkward, but take a look at my screen. You pull your cursor almost down to the very bottom, and do you see how right now my menu is blue? As soon as you see that, let go. And then what that allows you to do is see your pages and your properties stacked. Okay? I wish you had a little bit more real estate with this. This is kind of the new layout. You guys will see that I am still getting used to it. If you guys watch the video, you'll definitely know that I'm still getting used to it. Everything used to be up here and where the ribbon used to be, but now it's these submenus on the side and a couple of my favorite buttons are gone. Um, now looking at the pages menu, thinking back to Photoshop, if I asked you guys to add two new pages, do you guys think that you could, just kind of building on your previous knowledge? Take a look at that menu. Do you guys see something that looks familiar? Yeah, so I see a couple of people. So if you can, add enough pages so that you have three pages total. Good, I see some clicks. Now the button that you're looking for is this one right here. I'm hovering on it, it says create new page. And when you click on that, you can see a preview. Here's page one, here's page two. And if I click on another one, here's page three. Now with InDesign, you guys will see and learn that there are several ways of doing stuff. So what I'm doing right now, I um, held the Alt key down and that will let me zoom in and out with my roller ball. So you have to hold the Alt key and zoom in and out. Okay. And if you want to do a zoom all on a page, hit control zero. Okay, so alt roller ball or control Z, or sorry, control zero. I use those all the time. Okay. Now, I just went over how you could add two pages like this, but what you could also do is you can right click on one of your pages. And do you see how insert pages comes up? This allows you to add more than one page at a time. So if you know you need to add 25 sheets, instead of right clicking 25 times, you can just come over here and right click, insert pages, and then tell it how many. And you can even tell it where to go. If you're working on a group assignment and somebody was working on five pages in the middle, you could create those five pages as kind of like a placeholder for them in the middle. Okay. Everybody with me so far? Okay. So, so far, really, the only thing we know how to do is add new pages. But if you um, wanted to change 
the format of those pages, it's a little bit different because what you need to do is go to File and then Document Setup. Okay, so File, Document Setup. And then from here, you can pick the page size or do a custom size. So this is kind of like an abbreviated version of what we just saw in the main menu. So let's say you wanted an 11 by 17 is a tabloid. So 11 inches by 17 inches, that's also called a tabloid. Let's all click on that and then turn on preview and then even change it to landscape. Is everybody able to do that okay? Okay. And I'll probably just have you actually change it right back to letter and then portrait style. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about the screen a little bit. So on our screen right now, do you guys see how we have the purple and pink lines? So those are non-printing objects, and there's going to be several non-printing objects. The two main ones are our margins and then something called frames, which have kind of like a light blue. Now click W for me and tell me what happens. Yeah, so W switches from work mode to a print preview mode. Okay, so throughout the class and throughout like your projects, what I like to do is hit W so that you can kind of see a print preview mode. Okay, so W toggles you back and forth. Um, now that we've seen our pages, let's talk about how to actually get So the most important thing that I'll be talking about today is F for frames. And frames will allow you to add images you to add text. And then within those subcategories, there's a lot more to do in there too. But really, everything in InDesign essentially revolves around frames. Um, I'd like to start by going over some text and relate it back to Microsoft Word because I think, can I assume that everybody in here has worked in something like Microsoft Word where you open up a document and you start typing, yeah? So it's a little bit different here. Right now if we start typing, really nothing would happen. Our cursor would probably get mad at us. So what we're gonna do first is hit F for frame and your cursor should change into a crosshair. Mine won't look like anything on your screen but it should change into a crosshair. And we're going to draw our first frames. There's two ways of doing it. The first one is to click and drag, and you get kind of like a freehand frame. So go ahead and just click and drag a couple freehand frames. And essentially all of those frames are waiting for you to put content in them. Whether it's text or images, they're just waiting to be filled. Now hit Control Z and go back to where you just have one. Okay. So Control plus Z until you have one. And then on your next one, instead of clicking and dragging, click on the screen and you should see a dialog box pop up. So this time, instead of freehanding it, you can come in and say that you want to draw a four by four inch rectangle. Now if I was in Photoshop and I wanted to move this rectangle, what would I need to hit to change my cursor? 
V. Good. So I'm going to hit V. And now I can grab this and move it around. And you guys can see, hopefully, that if you pick it up and put it in the center, these two purple lines pop up to let you know that it's centered. These are called smart guides. Let's also look at our properties. So take a look at your properties. Do you see that when nothing is selected, it talks about my paper, right? But when I click on an item, like a frame, it talks about the frame. So right now on my frame, do you see where it says width and height, how it says four by four? If I wanted to change it to three and a half, so 3.5, and then I'm just gonna hit tab to go down to the next one, 3.5, enter. I can change it to be three and a half by three and a half. So why don't you all change the size of your frame to be three and a half by three and a half? And then you might need to hit V again, but then try to recenter it for me. Okay, so click on the frame, width and height. On the second one with that. Yeah, either one really. And then on that note, Ashley, let's go ahead and grab the other one and change that one to be a three by three. And then just center that one up at the top. So we've got a three by three centered at the top and then a three and a half by three and a half centered in the absolute middle of our page. Maddie, so did you get yours okay? Yep, now you've got, so it's right next to it, so not the X, Y, but the W and the H, the width and height. There you go. Now I have my top square selected. In Photoshop, if you want to duplicate something, what key do we hold down? Yeah, so similar in InDesign, again, I'm sorry you can't see it on mine, but make sure you're in V. Click on the top one, hold the Alt key down, and you should see the double arrowhead come up. Drag it down and copy it to the bottom. So you can also copy frames. That work for you guys? Right, so we've got a three by three, a three and a half by three and a half, and then just another three by three. Um, hit W for me and let me know. Do those blue lines actually print? They don't, right? So they're just there waiting for text. Now, to change any frame into a text box, let's do this top one up here. Let's go ahead and just type in T. And you'll see your cursor change again to a text cursor. And then click in it, and now you should see your cursor waiting for you to type. So for this first one, go ahead and type your name and maybe some contact information. Once you get your contact information in there, just like Microsoft Word, you would have to highlight your text, and you'll see your properties have changed to show character and text, but you can come here and change the font, okay? You can also change the size, and then you've got some paragraph options as well. Now go ahead and take a look at my screen. Again, this is a new menu this year, but do you see these three little dots by character? If you click on that, more options are going to pop up, and then you have to scroll down to find the rest. And you see there's another three dots here. 
So we will refer back to these every once in a while. Okay. But for now, what I want you guys to do is to um, first under the paragraph menu, do you see how Salt Lake Community College kind of fell off this line right here? It's being hyphenated. You can turn off hyphenation. And what that does is it makes it so that every word has to be a whole word. So that's under hyphenate. And I found this in the expanded paragraph menu. Now after you turn off hyphenate, I'm going to go through and show you guys what all of these different characters do. So we already know how to make the font size bigger. But then next to that we have leading, which is essentially line spacing. So you can pull up on this and make your lines further apart, or you can push down and bring them closer together. Now there are some kind of like script fonts that when you return to the next line it looks like there's a mile between them. That's when using leading helps. Okay. Now while we're talking about leading, I'm going to show you guys one other thing that kind of ties into leading. So go ahead and pull all the way down for me. You know what? Nope, it's not in this menu anymore. I can't show you. I'll show you in a minute. Yeah, Maddie? I don't know where that is. Uh, it should be there. So hit escape for me. Okay, and now go ahead and type in T to go back in there. Oh, can you not see them anymore? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Let's keep going. So keep playing with your text. So highlight your text and then we'll come back to it, okay? Um, so I'll show you what I meant, uh, the tie-in with the leading here in just a bit. Now, I don't play with the kerning, so I'm going to skip this one, but tracking, I think we use quite a bit. So if you ever needed to spread your words out a little bit further, if you're doing like a full justification, so here's what I mean by that. Like if I were to come here, and squeeze my box in. Down here at the paragraph, do you see how mine is aligned to the center? Okay. You could also turn on justify, which means that it's going to try to make everything fit on one line. Let me do full justify. So what um, tracking does is I can take the spaces between my words and again spread them out a little bit so it matches everything down here. Do you see how the 801 and the 957 have a huge space between them? If I highlight this and increase the tracking, it ends up looking a little bit better. The SLCC still looks awkward. I can take care of that later. But that's just a quick example on how you can use tracking to either spread your words or your letters further apart or pull them a little bit closer together. Okay. Now for the next one, go ahead and highlight some more text. And the next two, they essentially can make your letters taller. So I'm going to make be really dramatic so I can make it 150 higher. Okay. And I can also make it like 50% um, skinnier. What I wouldn't do is keep them in proportion. So what I mean is see how this is 150 and that's 50? I don't think you'd ever do 150 and 150. If that's the case, just go ahead and make your font a bigger size so you don't need to do it in proportion. Everybody with me on that one? So again, this is just really a, uh, a personal preference so that if you find a font and it just looks a little bit squatty to you, you know, you can change it. We don't use these often. Typically our fonts just look the way that we want, but in case you want to do something extra, you can find it in here. 
Now the next one um, that we'll be looking at there usually is, so let me show you kind of another shortcut to it. So baseline shift, let's say my name is like Naima McNawabi, okay? I can take the C and shift it up. You know, sometimes the, like with the MC it's supposed to do that. I could also be like Naima first place or something like that. So I can grab that and take the first up. Again, sometimes, especially when you're using like custom script fonts, some letter will just be down really, really low and you might just want to lift it up a little bit, especially if it's for a logo, like if you really want to fine tune. Don't go through a whole document and try to lift up every J, you know, but if you're working on a logo or something, you can do more customization in here. Now the other thing that you could do that's probably even better is down here, go ahead and write first, just like I did. So the one and then the ST. I'm gonna go ahead and left justify this again. So first left justified, and then we're gonna highlight the ST. And then on this menu here in the middle, do you guys see where my cursor is on Superscript? If you click on that, it'll automatically take care of it for you. So it makes the font smaller and it takes it up a little bit. Did that work for you guys? Okay. We've also got a footnote. If you need to make a footnote, there's a, like a more appropriate way of doing it, but it is in here. And then let me also show you, let me see, is this the font that I'm using right now, I'm going to change it real quick because it's a capital font. Oh, swear jar violation number two. Julianne, was that you again? <laughs> that was as bad as Revit the other day. <laughs> Did I say swear jar? I meant yawn jar violation. <laughs> so if you have a lowercase font, and you want to make it all caps, what you can do is, do you see this all caps right here? You can click on that and just, it'll automatically capitalize it for you. And then if you don't like the look, deselect it and it'll revert it back to what it was. There's another look called small caps that you can do. And I have to come back around to this. For some, the small caps was like all the rage in like the late 90s and early 2000s. And so I'm having a hard time like disassociating with that. So I'm, I'm trying to come back around to it, but I don't use that often. Who knows, you guys will bring it back in style along with many other fashions. <laughs> um, and then I think the other two are pretty straightforward, underline and strike through. The only thing I didn't talk about is um, essentially the fake italics, the angle. So if you have a font that doesn't have italics, you can essentially make one by changing the degree angle of it. Okay. So that's in there for you too. So with the text frame, the thing to remember is that when we're working within the text frame, we're working with the character and paragraph, okay? So almost everything you'd see on Microsoft Word is in here. Do me a favor though, hit escape to get out of it. And do you see that now we're in the text frame, right? So we're no longer in the actual individual characters, but we're in the text frame. So let's double click to go back inside and we're back to, you know, the character, and the text style, but when we hit escape, we're back to the text frame. Do you guys see the difference between the two? So double click in, character, text style, hit escape, click on it, text frame. Okay, they're different from one another, but you can still have some um, formatting things that you can work on here. And I think one of the main ones is if you click on options, you can change how your text is aligned within that frame. 
Okay, so up until now we've talked, like, well, we haven't talked about it, but we know that you can center or right or left, right? But what you can also do, turn on preview for me. And let me show you again how I got there. So when you have the text frame selected, all the way down at the bottom, do you see where it says text frame and then options? So text frame options. Click on that for me. And then turn on preview. And where it says vertical justification, we can center the text in our text box. We can align it to the bottom or we can also justify it. So earlier when I was showing you guys how to justify the text or change the spacing between the lines, justify does something similar. Yeah, Maddie? My So it should hit escape for me so you're no longer typing inside and click on it to where, do you see these little squares, the grip points around it? Mm -hmm. Does it look like that when you're selected? Uh, yes. Okay, so under properties, does it say text frame? Uh -huh. Okay, scroll all the way down to the bottom for me. And do you see where it says text frame and then options? Yes. Okay, you got it? Yeah. Okay, so that's the difference between being in the text frame with the characters and just having the text frame selected, right? So options will be important for you guys to know where to find it. They've really buried it in our new version. It used to be a nice, beautiful series of buttons, but they've taken them away. I'll see if I can bring them back if there's like a window shortcut. But a lot of times to help you with your graphic layouts, it's good to know whether you do want your text aligned to the bottom, to the top. It'll just help your documents look cleaner and cleaner. Okay. Everybody with me so far? So that was just some basic character stuff. Now, the thing that we haven't talked about yet with text, there's two things. One is essentially how to add color, and I'll probably get to that later. But the other thing that we haven't talked about is how to add multiple pages of text, okay? So to do that, let's go to page two and three, and let's actually add, let's add four more pages, so we have seven pages total. Test, okay, good. I didn't think I was recording, that scared me. And then what I'd like you guys to do on page three, not on page two, but on page three, make a, s a couple small frames. Okay, so on page three, a couple small frames. And then on page four, do another small frame, it doesn't matter where. On page five, do two tiny frames. And then on page six, make a pretty normal sized one, I guess. We'll see how far we need to go. On my pages it says, do not or do not share and then for outer just, oh, shoot. Sure. No, so one? you don't want to be in that screen. You want to be in the one below it. So don't work up here. Work down here in the pages menu. Okay, I don't know how. I'm not sure either. So down here in pages, do you just have one page, or how many pages do you have? Um, on that one. So oh, do you see this line underneath A Master? Okay. How many pages do you I have? Okay, so double click on page three to make sure you're back in here. It should look blue. Okay, and then go ahead and add the new pages and the frames. That sounds like my lecture. That was in my own. Was that a lecture of mine? <laughs> oh, well, it sounds like me. That was awkward. Uh, seven total. Now, one thing I'm going to show you guys how to do is, okay. Do you see how right now there's little tiny previews of what is on my pages? You can right click and go to um, panel options. Okay, so again, right click panel options. 
and you can do extra large or jumbo. So you can make these bigger. Jumbo is subjective. It's really not that big, but it's a little bit bigger. So you can see the content on your pages. And then, Maddie, are you still, did you still lose your frames? Go to view and then um, go to extras and maybe you hit control H on accident. Do show frame edges. So, does it? Just click on it for me. Did it bring them back? So it took mine away. Let me go back. Um, that did bring them back for you? Okay, I'll have to figure out what happened over there. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, yeah. Okay. And then when you guys are done with that, go back to page two, and you're going to make the biggest frame that goes from this corner to that corner. Okay, so we're going to do frame, this corner to that corner. So everybody with me so far? Do you guys have seven pages with a whole bunch of random little frames on them? Yeah? Okay. So again, the, the frames can really just be random. They don't have to look exactly like mine. What we want to do now, let's hit T for text again and click inside of our big frame on page two. And after we do that, what we're going to do is go up to type and do you see down here almost at the very bottom it says fill with placeholder text it's gonna just fill it up with random text we have no idea what it's gonna say okay. yes it's just ran it's a random ease okay just out of curiosity does yours end with a question mark or is it all really that random Okay, good. That's right. So what we have to do is just kind of pay attention to my screen versus your screen. Um, so now hit V for me so that, sorry, that, did, <coughs> that didn't work in text mode. Hit escape um, so that we can actually select our text frame. So Maddie, sorry, hit T for text and then double click inside of your frame or just click. And now go up to type and then fill with placeholder text. So now that we have this, what we're going to do is we are going to take our cursor down to the bottom to this grip point. Do you see I get, well, you should get a double-headed arrow. Then pull up until this is only about one and a half inches. And I'm actually going to change the height to 1.5 over here. Did you guys get that okay? No, this is so subtle and you've only been looking at InDesign for less than an hour. But when you did that, did you notice this little red plus sign pop up? So let me pull this back down to the bottom. See how there's no red plus sign down here? That means that all of my text fits. If I change the height back down to an inch and a half, this red plus sign pops up. So what we're going to do now is click that red plus sign. And now I'm going to click into one of my other text frames. So I'm going to do the first one. I'm going to hit the plus sign and then do the second one on that page. Let me show that to you one more time. So here's my plus sign. So I click once. It fit a few more items, but it still doesn't fit. So I hit the plus sign and I do it again. So go ahead and keep doing that plus sign until it all fits. You might use all of your text boxes, you might not. 
And let's see, when I get to, that was really lucky. When I got to page six, all of mine ended up fitting. You too? First try. And Maddie, you are working blind. Do this for me, hit escape. And then just draw a big box around that right page to see if we can find your text boxes. Okay, now go up, everybody else ignore this, but when this is selected, do you see where it says stroke? Mm -hmm. Take that up to one point, and that should at least outline your text box for you. And take that up to one. Okay, and then click off. Do you see them now? Mm -hmm. Okay, cheat and do that for now, okay? Yeah. So the thing about this that I want you guys to see is that in InDesign, you don't work from page to page. You work from frame to frame. So right now we have a network of frames um, that are essentially holding the contents of one article. So when you guys go home, or even while you're on campus, go pick up a magazine. Stop at Barnes & Noble and take a look. But publishers use InDesign to lay stuff out. So they'll take an entire article, and instead of just putting it on one big page, they'll put it in different frames throughout the layout, okay? The other thing that I think is cool about this, let's go back to that first page, like pages two and three. And this is another part where you'll have to pay attention to your screen versus mine. But do you see on my second frame right here, it starts with this word, like rempor, right? If I delete that, it only deletes the frame, but all of that content skipped down to the next frame because it knew where to put it in order. So let me show you again. Rempor, C, right? Rempor and C. When I delete this one, there's rempor, and let's see, I don't know where C went. It's in here somewhere, because I didn't delete it. Oh, there we go. Yep, thank you. So it's still there. So again, deleting the frame doesn't mean that you're deleting the content inside of it. Now, if I didn't have a frame for it to go to, see how like eventually on this one, that red plus sign pops back up? It wasn't there a minute ago. Um, so first let me fix it if I can make it bigger. Okay, now everything fits, my red plus sign is gone. But if I delete these two, the red plus sign comes back. So I can grab, I can do the plus sign. And this time, see how I don't have a frame? I can actually just click and drag and make one. Or I can click and by default, it just kind of goes across the page and you can reformat it if you want to. Okay, so everybody comfortable with how text frames work? Okay, now with our text frame, um, I'm trying to decide if I should show you guys color. Let me go ahead and show you color. I think it's okay. Let's go back up to our name. Not that whole long thing, but let's go up to our name and click on it. We're not going to double click on it. We're just going to click on it. So we're in the frame. And under appearance, do you guys see where it says fill and stroke? Okay. In Photoshop, when something was transparent, it was gray and white checker. In InDesign, if something is transparent, that means that it's white with the red strike through it. Okay. There's a difference between white and transparent. So for this, if I wanted to add some color to the actual text frame, see where I am text frame, I could double click on fill. And do you guys see how I have something called my swatches? Or I can go to a paint palette. The paint palette should look similar to Photoshop. So why don't you grab a color to change your text frame to. Everybody got that so far? Now, let's say that you also wanted to do your text. Do you see where it says apply to and then it says frame? 
you could pull down and switch it to text and see how my text is black. What you want to do here, and I'm almost losing it, but do you see these three little lines right there? You have to pull down and reset your colors to CMYK. And I'm, it's totally falling off my screen, so you can't even see it on the recording. Do you guys see it on your screen, though? Mm -hmm. When you push on it, you can do CMYK. Okay, and then you can pick a color for your text, too. By default, it just gives you the black or white option, but you can bypass that and find more color options. So far, so good? Okay. Do you see the next item down that's called stroke? Okay. This is an outline. And so let's click on that again. And I'm actually going to. I don't like that my menu is popping off the page. I'll do my best. To, hopefully you guys will be able to see it. So with the stroke, what this is going to do now is outline it. So if you um, come up here, oh whoops, sorry, this is confusing. Right now is it making your text thicker? Okay, so what we need to do on this is double click, or just, uh, is it click or double click? It's just a click, and now change the apply to back to your frame. And now that we're back to our frame, do you see how there's no stroke on our frame? Let's change that and actually add a stroke to our frame. And I actually changed a color that I didn't want to change. There we go. Does everyone have a stroke color? Almost. Do you guys want me to show you where to get it again? Mm -hmm. So just click on where it says stroke and make sure that you're at least, you know, four points so you can see it. And then click on where the actual color of the stroke is. It took me a couple tries. It's not a double click, it's a single click. It eventually comes up and change it apply to frame instead of text. And then you should be able to click a color, pick a color. Got it? Okay. Now one other thing I want you guys to do after you get the color, click on the underlined word stroke again. Let's start down here in the middle at a line stroke. Do you guys see how right now it's in the center? So do you guys see my light blue line? Let me zoom in. And it's coming off of both sides of that line. Okay. You can also send it to the inside. And what that does is let's say you have to have exactly a 4x4 four four frame. By sending it to the inside, it puts the stroke on the inside so you have exactly a 4x4 four four frame still. Or Let's say that you have a picture in here, and by sending it to the inside, it's starting to cover up some detail, like someone's face, a floor plan. You can also send it to the outside. So typically, when I work with the stroke, I either put it on the inside or the outside, but I almost never put it on the center, because the center doesn't align with anything. Like when you're doing your smart guides, your smart guide aligns with the blue line, Right? It doesn't align with where the stroke is offsetting to. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay, so always try to get it to the inside or outside so you can align it with something. Now coming all the way back up to the top, of course you can change the size, but you can also change your line type. So if you pull down on this menu here, there's different line types. And I'm cheating because I had to go, you guys have to forgive me, a lot of these menus have moved around to where I'm used to them being. But when you click on stroke again, 
Do you see where it says gap color at the bottom and it says none? You can change it so that the gap color is no longer white or transparent. You can actually change that to have a different color if you want it to. Everybody with me so far? Now let's say that if you wanted your gap color to match this, you could just as easily take your stroke and place it on the inside. So now you can see the real difference between going to the in or to the out. It covers up your content. Um, you can also do similar things with your text. So now, um, let me do it this way, this way is easier. Let's go ahead and just keep our text frame selected, but this time let's pull down, or let's click on the actual stroke. So not the word stroke, but the graphic stroke part of it. And let's apply it to our text. And now I'm gonna select like a black, color, you can actually put a stroke around your text as well. I think it gets really chunky and very illegible very quickly. So I almost go down to like 0.25 to make it nice and subtle. And again, the way that I got here, I clicked on the icon for the stroke or the fill and I changed it from apply to frame to apply to text. And that way I could change the color. So here's what it looks like red. I don't know why it reset here, but I'll reset it again. But you can add color there too. Were you guys able to trace around that okay? Yeah? Okay, good. All right, last but not least, let's do one other thing with these frames before we move to images. Okay, do you guys see this little blue, not blue, what color is that? Yellow. <laughs> do you see where it says click to edit corners? Click on it for me, and then it moves to the top, right? And now drag it, and you can round the corners. But wait, there's more. Let me remember how to do this. Hit Alt, click, and it changes the shapes one more time. So hold the Alt key down and keep clicking on that little yellow triangle diamond shape, and you can get some options. Yeah? Cool. All right. So that's one hour of text frames and just different options for the frames as well. So honest to goodness, in this hour, we've done about three to three and a half classes before we would just drag it out. We'd do one thing one day and then we'd add another thing and another thing. But what ended up happening is while somebody was working on that one thing, they'd want to know how to do those three other things. So last semester I was like, okay, hey, we're going to do it this way. Boom. And still kind of seeing how it's going. It's definitely overwhelming. Um, but I don't know. I personally think that this will serve you better in the long run. All right, so I'm done with text frames from now. Now I want to get into image frames. So image frames work similar to text frames in the way that you place them and create them. So at the end of our document, let's do insert pages. Let's insert four pages at the end of the document. So I did a right click. So insert four pages at the end. So now we've got four blank pages. Um, 
Um, now that we're in here and looking at images, what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you guys how to place an image. So if you look up here on the board, images, we place them. And the shortcut for it is control D. And there's two ways of doing it, but I want to do it with a frame first. So go ahead and do F for frame. And let's draw however you want to do it. Let's do a four by six. So width four, height six, and then center that for me. So four by six, centered. And in fact, while we're here, why don't we use the Alt key and copy this over to the other side? So we have two four by sixes centered in that spread. Now that we've got the two of these, let's click the one on the left. And let's do control D to place an image. So this is where things get completely new than I think what you're ever, uh, ever used to. So let me take a break and just talk about images and InDesign first. Um, how many of you guys have had X referencing in CAD before? Can I get a show of hands? So just a few of you, that's okay. For those of you guys who are working in X references and CAD, just know that it's similar. So in a program like Microsoft Word or PowerPoint, the way that it works is you start out with the file and the file is really small. Like it might be like four, four bytes, really, really small. And every time you add an image into it, it gets bigger and bigger depending on the size of an image. So if you have, you know, 10 pictures, that are like um, eight megabytes each. Now you have an 80 megabyte file. See how all of those kind of added to the file? And it essentially gets heavier and heavier and slower and slower. So the way that InDesign works is that instead of taking the pictures and actually physically placing them in the file, what it does is the way that it works, here's your InDesign file. And then somewhere on your computer, your cloud, your USB, you have your images. And what it does is it just does a preview of those images. So it's the actual image, um, but it just sources to it. So rather than the file getting really big and heavy, it keeps all of the files in one location and just pulls them into your file. So it keeps the file really small. And then the other thing that it does is that it also allows you to simultaneously update your images. And we're going to talk about that too in just a minute. So that if you have a floor plan that you update, InDesign will look at that updated file and pull that one in, as long as it's the same name. Okay, so let's do our Photoshop board for example. When you guys start working on your board, let's say you're Photoshopping your room, right? It's a work in progress, so you could have your whole board laid out. And then as you're working in Photoshop, let's say you change out the sofa and move a table, InDesign will see that you've moved a sofa and table and it'll change it in that document too. So the two work together. It's not in, in Microsoft Word and PowerPoint, once you put that in there, it's one and done. It's no longer connected to that file. Where in InDesign, those files stay connected to one another. And we'll do a little practice of that today. So file management is really important when we're working in InDesign because you want to make sure that you know where your files are and you don't move them. So for example, if right now I have a desktop folder called Digital Graphics and I'm going to put my images in there, I don't want to move that off my desktop or InDesign will say, where did your images go? and won't be able to find them. So it's important to keep your files organized as we work through it. So for the first one, um, again, I hit Control D. And I don't know where you guys put yours. They could be in your downloads. 
But as I mentioned, I have mine in my InDesign import folder. And the first one that I want to pull in is the one Vila Savoy. So I just find it, I'm going to click open, and then I'm going to hang out here with you guys. Does your screen look like my screen? Kind of just seeing a corner of the image. So let me explain to you guys what we're looking at here. So we are looking at the frame and then we're looking at the actual size of the image. So everybody take your cursor and take it to the center of your frame and you should see a little hand pop up. So give yourself a little high five. And then when you do that, do you guys see an extra frame? kind of like a brownish colored one pop up. Yeah, so that's showing you the actual image size versus the size of the image in the frame. Okay, so your images come in full size. So if you were to actually print out this image, if I look over here on the width and height, this is about a 14 by 10 image. And my um, sheet size is only eight and a half by 11. That's why it's so much bigger. So go ahead and hit escape for me. So we deselect that. And what we're going to do now is we are going to go to this frame fitting option. Do you guys see that? So the only frame fitting options I want you guys to use are these two first ones because they are proportionate. These two are not. So click on the first one, which is fill frame proportionately. So do you see that the frame is filled right now, but the image is still cut off. Let's click on the next one. What that one does is it fits the content portion proportionately. But see how I have like all this extra frame that I don't need? So again, the frames are important. So in this case, let's say that we did actually need to fit the entire picture. Like if it's a floor plan or a detail, we probably want the whole thing. So after we get it to fit, actually before we get it to fit, click on the other two just so you can see how wrong they are. See how it's no longer proportionate and the Vila Savoy has just been stretched to fit? Your images shouldn't ever look like that. So go back and change it to fit content proportionately. I wish they would just get rid of these buttons. I'd be so much happier. Um, and then what I want you guys to do is do... Um, fit frame to content. Let's see how it just snugs over, over your drawing. So for the first little bit, you'll probably have to hover and read these until you get used to them, but it's really these three buttons here that we're working with the most. You guys with me so far? Okay, so again, by default it comes in large, but we still have the opportunity to change its size. Let me come back to this for a minute. Let's say that we actually don't want to see this side of the building. So when you click on this, again, when you come to the center, do you see how it goes from being blue to kind of that golden brown color? Once you get that selected, grab an edge for me. And here is, let me make sure this works. Hold on, I'm not sure. There's a slight difference between Photoshop and InDesign right now. Yes, this is not good. So hold, right now, if you just take your cursor and drag it, do you see how you can make it any size? You don't want to make it any size. What you want to do while you're dragging is to hold the Shift key down, and that'll do it in proportion. Essentially, what you want to check for me do again another menu that's missing. So do you see these three dots up here? More options. Click on the three dots. And do you see how I have this number right here? It's at about 58%. Do you guys see those? This is the percentage of how far you're zoomed into the picture. You want to make sure that these numbers are the exact same. Now, what Photoshop did this last year is it made it so that when you grab these corners, you don't have to hold shift down. It will always do it in proportion. Unfortunately, InDesign has stayed back 
and you have to hold shift. So just be careful as you move back and forth between the two programs. Don't forget which one uses shift and which one doesn't. If you hold shift down in Photoshop, it'll unlock the proportion lock. So they're backwards of each other now. Okay, but do you guys see the percentages? What do you think the biggest number you should see in this box should be? 100%, yeah? So I can grab this and I can keep going bigger and bigger. Okay, but the bigger I get, the more pixelated my image will be. See how at 134 it looks pretty terrible, right? Um, it won't look quite this bad, but it'll still look bad. Let me show you guys. So why don't you guys take your image and let's just change this to 100% so we can see what it looks like in actuality. Okay, so let's get it to 100. I'm just going to kind of zoom in right here. Did everybody get that to 100? Okay. So again, I just you click on the image using the hand, and then in more options, you should be able to get it to 100. I think most people have it. So would you guys agree that even though it's at 100%, it still looks kind of terrible, right? So here's another thing that's going on with um, InDesign. This program gets really image heavy, especially once we start doing our portfolios and other things. So by default, it's on kind of a low quality preview mode. So right now, without anything selected, right click on your screen. And do you see where it says display performance? Do you guys see that right now it says typical display? That is a low preview, oh, sorry, low quality preview change it to high quality and you can see that it improves a little bit. Okay, So if you're worried that all of your images look pixelated, again right click and go to high quality and you can see what it really looks like there. Okay, let's do a couple more. So let's come in here and do another control D. And then this time, what I want you guys to do is to pull in the Vila Savoy, but I want you to make it fit so that the width of the image is six inches. So I'm going to have you guys do some of the edits on your own, and then I'll help you with it in just a bit. I'm going to hop in and help. So on this particular one, I want it to be six inches wide, but right now it's um, four inches wide. So I'm going to change this to be six inches, and then I'll change the height to be four. But do you see how it keeps changing it on me? That's because this is locked. So again, I'm going to make this six. I'll unlock this and make the height four. So the key here was unlocking it so that you can change it. And then after that, what I want to do, I'm just trying to get it centered. I don't know why. There you go. Um, after you have the right frame, then we go into our fitting and let's fill the frame proportionately.
So again, I clicked on it. I deselected the constrained proportion so I could make it a six by four, and then I can turn it back on again. And then what I did, I made sure that my image was fill frame proportionately. Now, for those of you guys who did the six by four, tell me about how zoomed into your image you are. Can you guys take a look? Percentage wise, how zoomed in are you? What was that? 36. About 36, okay. What else do you guys have out there? 54. 54? Any other numbers? 51. 51. So mine is at 54. So with my 6 by 4, it ended up being at about 54%. So if your frame is a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller, you'll get a different number. But this is essentially telling you that you're safe. You're not going over the 100% range. So you're OK to use your image at this size. OK. Couple more image things. On this next page right here, let's do another freehand frame. And I want you guys to pull in the Vila Savoy PSD, but turn on show import options for me. So make sure it's the PSD. Mine kind of looks like this. So not to Vila Savoy, but just Vila Savoy. And again, right here, do you see where it says show import options? Click that so that when we hit open, we get this new dialog box. And I love this dialog box because what it lets us do is, do you see right now it shows us the different layers in the file? Like for example, we can turn off this SLCC layer and it just brings in the background. Uh-huh. How do you hit square again? Okay, so when you hit control D, do you see where it says show import options where I'm pointing? Mm -hmm. Make sure you click on that and bring in Vila Savoy. Not to Vila Savoy, but Vila Savoy. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm turning off SLCC and then I'm hitting OK. And then let's go ahead and get this fit in here correctly. So I'm just going to do um, fit content proportionately. And then I'm also going to fit framed content. Thanks, Jane. Yeah. How did you turn off the SLCC? OK, so hit, uh, click on the frame again. So V and then Control D. And then make sure you have show import options selected when you go to Control D. And then pull it in one more time. And you see I can turn off SLCC right there? That's how you can control it. Mm -hmm. Now let's do this. Let's make a copy of it. So another Alt. Let's just drag it to the other side. And then on this one, I want you guys to right click and go to um, Edit Original. So right click, Edit Original. It's kind of down towards the bottom. And what it should do is open up um, Photoshop for you. And then it's going to ask you something about the text layers. Just say no. Essentially, it doesn't have the font that SLCC was made in. So it wanted to know if we wanted to update it with a new font. So while you're in here, make a new layer. Call it something like junk or test, whatever you want. So new layer, junk, test, scratch, whatever. And then on this layer, grab your brush, just your paintbrush, and just write something. Just kind of draw on it, whatever you want to do. I have a terrible brush for this. Okay. 
Then once you've got something exciting on there, go ahead and go back into InDesign. Nope, not yet, sorry. We have to save this, so hit Control S while you're in Photoshop. So Control S does a quick save. And then go back into InDesign. And do you see that for better or worse, your file has been updated? Okay, mm -hmm. it did both sides. I don't know, the reason, do you see how where the SLCC was, it didn't bring the SLCC back, but it just brought in the new layer? So it just wants to show you the new stuff. Let's say, for example, on our um, dollhouse, you still want the empty dollhouse on the side. What you can do is click on the image on the left and right click. Um, and do you see where it says object layer options? That essentially takes you back into your import uh, layer options menu. So now we can turn off junk. And it kind of preserves that one to what it was. So for your final, it won't be like a whole bunch of squiggly lines, but it could be just new things that you're adding. Making you win as far as sketches on stairs. She drew like a shark. She turned her stair into a shark. <laughs> it's really fun. <laughs> I'll have to remember that for next semester. Okay, so we've been going really strong for an hour and 20 minutes. Let me show you guys one more thing, and then we're just going to pass out and be done. It's like six classes in one <laughs> at this point. David, was that a question? Um, in Photoshop, you have to hit Control S to save it and then come back in. Yep. There it is. Bellissima. Okay. Uh, for this next one, two more pages at the end for me. And we're going to wrap up by talking about PDFs. Now for this last page, we're not going to make a frame first. And this is just to kind of show you guys why I like to create frames first. So in this spread, go ahead and hit Control D. And we're just going to pull in this 4.1 interior elevations. And then open. Now all of us probably have show import options on right now, right? So it came back into this menu. Just know that unless you turn on show import options, the only page that it will insert from a PDF is the first page. So do you see that this one is actually five pages? And you can kind of go through it. Again, if you want more than the first page, turn on your import options. So for this one, let's do page three. And then more often than not, I don't want a transparent background. I actually want a white background. So if I stack plans on top of each other, they don't blend into each other, okay? So turn off transparent background, and then also crop it to the media, not anything else. Okay, so crop to media, transparent background. The reason why I like media is um, most of you guys have taken some sort of a construction drawing class. On your construction drawings, you typically have your sheet, and then you have a frame for your title block, and then everything else. What Photoshop, or sorry, what InDesign's trying to do is to ignore that nice little white edge between the edge of your sheet and your title block. And I like to preserve that. It just sees it as blank, but we want those there. So click OK. And you can see a preview on your cursor. It's not a mini version of it. It's a preview of it, and what we need to do now is to click to place it. And do you guys see that it's just way too big? I'm doing control minus to zoom out to it. It's just huge. And so this PDF is a good example of how big images are when you typically place them. Even cell phone cameras have such large pixels now that if you just do a control D or a place, it comes in really big. So it's always good, I think, to draw a frame first 
and then place your image. The other thing that you can do is if you do a control D and you forgot to draw a frame, you can try to do the click and drag and see how it's drawing it proportionately for me. You can drag and place it that way too. So let me do that one more time. So still without a frame, but control D, interior elevations, and then click and drag. You can do it that way as well. First part of your final project, and this will be the rough draft that's due next week. Okay, so it's not a big rough draft, but it's just to kind of get you started. Um, I can even show you, I'll even publish, so your whole rough draft, sorry, your whole final project again is a board and your design booklet for your client. That's the whole thing. What I'll be looking for for next week is a proposal of just the rough draft of your board because that'll give you a minute to get into the project and it'll also give you a minute to get comfortable with InDesign before we hop into it. So your rough draft for next week that I'll be looking for is a design board for your dream client or project. So I have always asked that you come up with the theme for your fictional client and some people have a really hard time with that, like it's just too much possibility. So if that's the case, you let me know and I will pick it for you. But just know, embark on the opportunity of having no budget and no creative constraints. Just do what you want. So, But if you need some direction, let me know. The reason why I want you guys to come up with it, because I strongly feel that if you come up with a client or a theme that you're passionate about, It'll be a lot better than me giving you something that you're kind of like, eh, whatever, you know. So try to turn it into a passion project. Um, so your layout will be essentially the overall vision for the project. And so we'll be looking for a 24 by 36 or a 30 by 42 board. So this will actually be this portion of it. Um, you're going to be making your InDesign board that size. And you'll also eventually be making a Photoshop board that size, if you want to. And I'll tell you why I'm saying if you want to. Um, you want your title and theme to go on there, designer information, and then three to five pieces of furniture, three to five accent pieces, three to five finishings, and then other for, for your choosing, just to kind of show what the feel of the room will be. So the project I want you to think of is it's going to be really similar to the dollhouse, but you're not necessarily going to have a wall or a room to kind of enclose you. You're just going to have kind of an open space to work with, right? So you can still skew stuff to make it look like there's perspective in it, but you don't necessarily need walls in it, okay? Um, so with the 24 by 36, let me tell you what I mean by that. So your entire board will be that big, okay? In Photoshop, it doesn't necessarily mean that your entire room is going to be that big. You might have, you know, um, like your cluster of furniture might only fill up like 18 by 24 inches of it, right? By the time you get it all together. Some people last year actually masked everything in Photoshop and did the entire layout individually in InDesign. Now, personally, I think it's easier to still mask everything in Photoshop and do the entire like room layout on in your Photoshop file and then bring it in and do like your labeling and all of that. But that's up to you how you want to work. Do you guys see the difference between the two? So in up until this point, you guys have done everything in Photoshop. Last, no, not last semester. The semester before, there are a few students who still masked all of their sofas, everything in Photoshop, but then what they did in InDesign, they brought everything in in individual frames and essentially mocked it up in InDesign. And that works too. The only limitations you have is if you want to start transforming 
you can't transform in InDesign. You have to get out of InDesign, transform in Photoshop, and then bring it back in. Does that make sense, the difference between the two? So it's up to you to do what you want. Um, now for your rough draft, what I'm looking for at this point, you don't need to have the board done or finished, but what I'm looking for is a strong concept of who your client is because it takes so much time just to poke around the internet and find files of what you want to start mocking up. So for next week, what I'm looking for is essentially one crazy big Photoshop file that maybe you've dragged everything into. And if that's, even that gets really big, so I'm trying to think of a better way for you guys to turn this in. You could even just upload all of your JPEGs individually, okay? So if you want, you can put everything in one Photoshop file or individual JPEGs of pieces you might use. So when we come to class next week, you're essentially just ready to work and keep cleaning those things up. Um, it's a lot to have a full board done in a week, especially if you're working towards a final, but I at least want you guys to get started. So the majority of your furniture pieces are selected, the majority of your finishes are selected, and you're kind of in the beginning phases or in the middle of masking everything and starting to get it arranged. Got it? So it's kind of like a working rough draft. Maddie? Do you have like pictures of past Yes, and here's the thing. I can show you guys those today if you want, or I can show them to you guys next week after you've started. The only reason why I'm saying after you guys have started is about a year or two ago, I showed a few examples, and every project turned out to look exactly like those. Not They didn't look exactly, but like everybody picked those themes. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I'd be happy to show you if it will inspire you, but I don't want you guys to get stuck on an idea. So here's where I'm coming from, where I think would be better. I would feel better if you guys just left today, found all of those objects, and then next week I'll show you the layouts so that that way you're inspired by the layouts and not necessarily someone's theme. And to be completely honest, all of your themes are going to end up being really similar, right? We're all influenced by the same things. We all live in the same age where the same things are popular, right? We, we want our styles to be relevant. But there's just too many things that came out similar to where I was like, this is why we're going to like the working rough draft. So would you guys feel okay if I don't show you the actual boards this week, but I show them to you next week so you guys kind of get your inspiration first? Yeah? Let's do that, and I promise beginning of class, I will show you guys the boards and the booklets, and I actually have um, a folder that I'll drop them into so you guys can keep coming back and looking at them. And I show you guys everything, the good, the bad, the ugly. I just want you guys to see what your peers have done and how you guys can be inspired and kind of improve upon it. Similar to our Revit class, it'll be a private lecture. I won't post it just because it's other people's work. If you're in my Revit class, we do the same thing. I pull up all of the old final projects. We go through it, the good, the bad, the ugly. I don't make it public so people don't see their work being talked about without their permission, but you guys can always come back and reference it later. Okay, but this is where we're going. And the booklet, since we just started InDesign today, you guys don't need to start on that until next class. But if you want to know where we're going, you guys will be doing a booklet and you'll be using all of the same images that you're masking and creating for your board, right? So it's kind of like a two for one, but you will be formatting the board to show a few extra pieces. Again, those alternates. So an alternate sofa, maybe an alternate table. And the reason why we're doing that is because when you work with the client, you typically want to have a couple alternates in your back pocket. It could be due to budget, it could be due to availability. Um, sometimes things are four months out and you can't wait that long. Sometimes something goes out of stock or you know it's, it's the wrong size. So it's always good to have some alternates. So there will be a few extra pieces that you will do for the booklet, but the majority of the stuff will come from your design board. Okay, so for now focus on that client. Go online, start scouring the internet, 
make sure the images you find are nice, big, heavy, pixel heavy images that you can easily use for this project. Um, I am not very good at finding good sources for images for projects. You know, where, so if you guys find a website, like you, whether it's West Elm or what's the one that we use, B&B Italia, if they have really nice big images, let people around you know, like, oh, I found a treasure trove of a manufacturer who puts really big images. From my experience, a lot of students who go online and grab stuff from like Wayfair and Overstock, they work, but they tend to be smaller. Remember, we're going to be putting these on a big board. So on this board, it's going to be, I'm going to just do the 24 by 36 size, but you can go bigger um, to the 30 by 42. I want this to be at least 150 pixels per inch. Okay. And online, you only get 72. So whatever you get online, you have to double that a little bit in order for it to look good printed. And I know I don't print stuff, but still, there might be a day where you have to print something, so that's why we're getting the board ready for it. Okay? And if it doesn't work, we'll find another alternate. That usually ends up being what happens. Okay? Um, this lecture will be...